Hello, hola, ni hao, Eagles. My name is Adriana Olivas from Iowa, Texas, Keller Saginaw High School, and I'm here to welcome you to our first leadership speaker series of the year. Today, I'm joined by my co-hosts and fellow scholars from Iowa, Texas campuses across the state. Hosts, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Hello, everyone. My name is Ji Jong, and I'm a junior from Iowa, Texas, Groland High School. At Iowa, Texas, leadership is our middle name. Leadership Speaker Series provides us the opportunity to learn and engage from the world's greatest leaders. Today, we are honored to join by Ambassador Liliana Ayalde. Hi, my name is Sanai Bailey, and I am at the Lancaster DeSoto High School. Ambassador Ayalde is a career diplomat with 38 years of experience in foreign affairs, security, defense, and development particularly in Latin America and the Caribbean from 2013 to 2016, overseeing a bilateral and global policy agenda, which include political, economic, and security issues. Hi, my name is Dr. Campbell from Lake Lakeland High School. She has, held, she has held assignments in Bangladesh, Guatemala, Nicaragua, and Bolivia, as the U.S. supporter for the 2014 World Cup, 2016 Summer Olympics, 2016 Paralympics, and then Brazil. She has, she has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Chairman of Joint Chief of Staff Joint Distinguished Civilian Honor Award, the highest award given to a civilian by the Department of Defense. My name is Jacob Wise. I'm a senior at Aguiland High School. Uh, Ambassador Ayalde uh, is a native of Maryland. She has a Bachelor's of Arts in the School of International Studies at uh, American University in Washington, D.C. She also has a master's in public health at uh, Tulane University, uh, and she uh, she's fluent in both Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, she also has a working knowledge in French. Uh, Eagles, please join us in giving a warm welcome to Ambassador uh, Ailan, Ayan. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to hear eagles. I want to hear them. I want to hear them soar. Hello. First of all, thank you for the warm introduction. I appreciate your kind words. Um, I want to um, thank CEO. Uh, Conger for the invitation to come and speak with you, to join the speakers program, to learn about the program you're in, to meet so many of you and to meet the teachers and the faculty and the staff. It's such a team, team effort. Um, and I guess my first message that I'd like to convey is how uh, impressed I am with with the program and the fact that you have decided to dedicate yourself to this investment of learning how to be good citizens, uh, to care, to have skills that will open doors for you in the future. Uh, it takes discipline to learn, uh, but the, being part of this program will take you very, very far. And so congratulations for, for being part of this and for all of those who support you, because this is not a one person effort. Um, families need to support you. The faculty needs to support you. Mentors help you and, and everyone. It's a real team effort. So congratulations for actually doing this. Uh, Estoy muy contenta de estar aquí con ustedes. 
me estoy maravillada con todo lo que ustedes hacen. Eh, el hecho de que son bilingües, trilingües, realmente, felicitaciones. I'm also glad to be here in the context of Hispanic Heritage Week, month. And uh, I guess a wave to all the Hispanics in the room, and it's a real occasion to, to celebrate um, the heritage that we bring to this country and the diversity that we bring to this country. And as a Hispanic myself, I'm very happy to be part of, uh, of the program today in the context of Hispanic Heritage Month. So thinking about what I could share with you, I've had an incredible career. Um, I'm very proud of now that I look back on 38 years of public service, uh, working in international affairs, uh, international development. Um, and those are the things that I loved every minute of it. And I wanted to, to think through, you know, what could I offer you I mean, as you start uh, thinking about what you're going to do with your futures, I look at you and I know that we have among you future leaders in anything you would like to do and probably things that you don't even know uh, are out there, uh, but you'll find a niche and each of you will, will become leaders, I am sure, because you are getting the education, you are getting the skills, you are learning about the traits of what makes a good citizen. And all of that will help you succeed and, and do well uh, in the future. But you know, what could I tell you that would be useful? Um, and I, after 38 years of public service, uh, I think back and, and there are some lessons learned that I would like to leave you with. And you can think about them. Um, some of them sound obvious, uh, but they're not as obvious when you actually go about your day-to-day -day, uh, living. So, so let me share these with you and, and, and hopefully they'll resonate. One is I realized that in order to succeed, you need to like what you're doing. You need to have a passion for what you're doing. Because if you do not like what you're doing, that's very negative and it's contagious. So people around you are not inspired. But if you like what you're doing, people get excited about what, you, you know, about what you're doing, what you're going to do next. And things just kind of work out. But most importantly, you will get noticed. And people will say, my God, look at her. Look at everything she's done. I will remember you because you are a true leader. And you know, if I have to think of someone that has your skills, I'll think of you, or I'll think of you, or I'll think of you because we were we had the chance to talk a little bit, and I remember the personal stories. Uh, but it's liking what you do that will get you. Uh, so so think about it. Don't do something you don't like because you'll be miserable. And there's something that we call in the service, it's uh, hallway uh, reputation. Uh, and I think that's what happened to me in my case. I loved every minute of what I did. I often get the question, what country did you like the most? What assignment that you served in did you like the most? And I say, well, I enjoyed every one of them. Because every, every assignment that I got, I learned something different about people. I learned something different about the actual work I was doing, the country I was at. Uh, so whether it's uh, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Bangladesh, uh, Colombia, uh, Paraguay, Brazil, all of them are different. And I felt that I was learning um, and liked everything I was doing. But as a leader, you have to have a passion for what you're doing because you want to get noticed. And I mean, but it's not conscious. It's just, you know, 
enjoy what you're doing uh, and, and don't be stuck in a situation that you are, are miserable and, and not having fun because you have to enjoy, uh, have fun along the way and inspire the team. And, and I guess that would be uh, a second message that we're all individuals and we're all leaders, but we're leaders because we depend on our team. And if we don't have a team, then we're not leaders. So the team is very important. The team is very important in helping you achieve success, get results. And in, throughout my career, I spend a lot of time in making sure my team, or my teammates, felt that they were empowered to speak up, that their voices were important, that they had the environment in which they had the freedom to provide me with opinions, that at the end of the day, as a leader, you get to make the decision. So you have the burden of carrying whatever decision it is that you make, but you're educated by different perspectives. So your team is very important because they will help you succeed, but you need to inspire your team so that they can help you succeed. So it's, it's you know, you're part of a team and it's a, a, a concentric circle. And so taking care of your team is very important. And sometimes when people move up in the, uh, as they become leaders and it's just, um, they forget about being good to your people. And so don't forget to be yourselves and don't forget where you come from and always be respectful of people in the process. So um, the other thing uh, that I would say is, um, you know, you do, you're not an expert. I found myself in positions that I would say, oh my God, I know nothing about that. But your team knows, you know, your team is an expert. So you rely on the diversity of opinions and the diversity of views. Uh, and the expertise of your teams. So that is uh, in, uh, in, important in the process of, of, uh, of working with your team and getting results, results done. So those are some, some initial comments of what I think is important, uh, you know, to be always true to yourself, uh, to care about your people, uh, to, to have a passion for what you do, um, those are all things that, that are important in the process of, of being good leaders. Some people are natural leaders, but some people uh, learn to be good leaders, and we're always learning. And so this is what I like about this program, that you're learning to be good leaders, and I have no doubt that you will succeed in whatever you choose to do. So um, those introductory comments, because I know what we want to get into is a conversation, and I don't want to monopolize it. So. All right, thank you so much. Now we'll go with Bailey. Ambassador Ayade, IOTech says give us the tools for future leaders. So in our leadership class, we are taught the 14 leadership traits and principles. However, before becoming a leader, you must be a follower. So in your experience, what provides traits for you to be an effective follower? So as leaders, um, and I was talking about teams, so you can, you always have somebody above you, right? So you're always a follower in some way, even though you're a leader. But one of the things that I've found very important to do, and particularly when you're working cross-culturally or in a, a scenario that is unfamiliar or different for you, is you have to listen. And as I mentioned before, I might say some things that are pretty obvious. Let me tell you, some people believe they have the, the, the answer and won't really listen. So they're looking at you, but they say, uh -uh, I know the answer. I don't need to listen. So I would emphasize that, you know, as a follower, you're, you have to listen to see what it is, what is it that we're trying to get here? Um, and so that is important. That's an important trait. Uh, but also, um, being able to work with each other. 
so you're not alone in this world and and being being part of a team and being a follower is you know you follow with others and sometimes that takes a little bit of patience um, and, and and communicating coordinating uh, so that you can actually get the team to work together and and following that takes a little bit of of investment of yourself to to be able to um, generate that uh, uh, joint thinking and, and so forth. So I would say that I would emphasize the listening um, and be able to be able to work with others um, as part of your team. Uh, thank you for your answer. And this is my question for you. Which of your previous leaders that had biggest influence, biggest influence on who you have become as a leader and why? Good question. Um, I've been so fortunate to have so many people in my life that I, I think have influenced me in one way or another. But uh, let me pick a couple. Uh, and I'll tell you why. So uh, when I finished my undergraduate studies, and I, unlike some of you who know exactly what you want to do, I wasn't very clear. I knew I'd liked international work. I liked international development. I got my master's in public health. And I, need, I, I knew I wanted to serve, uh, to be in public service in some way, but I didn't know exactly what to do with it. And one of my professors, and here comes in parenthesis, the importance of mentors in your lives. One of my professors says to me, you know, you'd be a great public servant. Why don't you apply to this program? And I said, really? No, I, that's, that's not me. And I said, give it a try. That was 38 years ago. I remained with the public service. So 38 years as a result of Dr. Bertrand believing me, knowing that those were the skills that, that uh, I guess I, uh, I could work with. And uh, he found that that would be my niche. And I have to thank him for believing in me and for, for helping me make that jump and deciding that, okay, well, I'm going to give this a try. And I did, and I loved it. I've loved every single um, opportunity that's presented my way. The other person I would um, highlight is one of the directors I had for uh, when I worked in development at USAID. USAID is the United States Agency for International Development. It is the agency of the U.S. government that manages uh, international cooperation, development assistance. So I was in Guatemala helping on the, uh, the, the health program. I knew how to design immunization programs. I worked with uh, a, a different kind of healthcare challenges. That was the area that I had been hired for. And I was doing a great job, feeling good, um, getting results. And the director calls me one day and says, you know, you're doing a good job. We're going to give you all our education portfolio, our, our, all our democracy and government's portfolio. And I said, wait, 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 wait a minute. That's not what I feel comfortable. I, that's not what I was trained for. Um, and he said, but you're a great manager. You work great with teams. You know how to lead. And I guess the lesson with that mentor, uh, or the reason I, I uh, use that as an example, is that that mission director basically helped me move from a technical field to a senior management field that then took my career in a totally different direction because I then knew that if I needed somebody who was an expert on democracy, I could call somebody on my team or somebody that was an expert on bilingual education, for instance, at the time we were supporting the bilingual education program in, in, in Guatemala, uh, you, you, that requires a lot of expertise. 
So we brought in the experts. So I learned that it, it was um, that, that I enjoyed being a leader, that I enjoyed uh, leading and caring for my people and getting results as a team, working the team. And so um, that supervisor at the time, uh, Mr. Katarucci, actually helped me move in from my comfort zone of where I felt very comfortable working on health to an area that does not was not comfortable. So at times as a leader, you need to, and if you want to progress in advance, you need to move out of your comfort zone and take some risks. And sometimes you may need a little push by someone. So in, in that case, you know, I, I, um, I think the fact that um, I look back and say, well, this was a person that I, I really uh, thank for having been instrumental in shaping my career early on in a direction that, that just made it grow in advance. Thank you for such an insightful answer. My question is, can you share a moment where you as a leader made a mistake and the lessons you've learned from it? So that's a, an interesting question in the field in, uh, that I've been working with, where you talk about diplomacy, foreign affairs, development. Um, there's really no right or wrong, uh, but maybe you don't have all the information that you need. So you kind of, move in the direction where you have more information, you add to it, and then you start making decisions based on that. So I would say that, you know, uh, there's, there's never really a wrong answer, but rather a, an answer that maybe didn't have the full information that you required. So you need to shape it and build on it and move on it um, and take it in a different direction. So, um, uh, and that's a learning process too, but it's, it's the field, the fields are very different. If you are maybe in the military and you make the wrong decision, you know, that is deadly uh, potentially, or in medicine, uh, you know, that, you know, there is a, a clear right or, or wrong. I think in the field of development and um, uh, in foreign affairs in general, it's about navigating, trying to find, you know, find that middle ground. Um, and they, and let's say you're, you're, you're negotiating with a counterpart in, in a different country and they just, we just don't see eye to eye on a, a particular policy. Well, you need to sit down and figure out how to get closer to that middle area where you're all in agreement. There's nothing wrong from starting it in a different angle, uh, but just you need those skills those communications, those negotiation skills or advocacy skills to try to get to that right middle ground where you are all in agreement. So I would say that uh, and that that's what I've learned that that there's there's really no right or wrong and at times you just have to shape it differently and that's it. but of course it really does depend on the field you're in because in some areas the wrong may be really um, uh, negative. That's re really interesting. Um, for uh, when you work with organizations, international organizations such as the Olympics, uh, what is one of the biggest uh, leadership challenges that you faced? So when I was in uh, Brazil, I had the privilege of experiencing the Olympics and the World Cup. These are mega events. And I never imagined of everything that goes behind these um, efforts. They're huge uh, because it, it entails not only the fun part of seeing the athletes compete, but it entails, and as an ambassador in Brazil, um, I was responsible for the security and the safety of the American citizens in Brazil. That's a heavy load because you can't control what everyone is doing. So the Olympics was going to, and in the case of the Olympics and the World Cup, it was going to attract a huge number of Americans coming uh, to the country 
to participate in these games, whether they were athletes, coaches, uh, you know, the uh, doctors that attended to them, the corporation that sponsored, uh, a lot of them are American companies that sponsored the Olympics or, or the part of the World Cup. So the issue of security and uh, became, became a big deal. Um, and it, it's difficult when it's not your country, right? So Brazil was hosting and we were a guest. And so how do you um, reconcile the demands of this case? It was the White House who was calling me saying, you know, we're worried about this may be happening because you, know, you have to be prepared for everything. So what if there was some biological warfare or something happening or a major disaster or something happened? Is the country ready? Does it have the medical resources? Does it have the personnel that's trained? Does it have the logistics, is everything thought out of? And I was in the um, position of having to work this with our hosts. So it's like telling them what they needed, but they're a sovereign country and they were doing quite fine but some others didn't think maybe they had, or because out of lack of knowledge, they thought, well, maybe they don't have uh, the necessary hospitals in case there's a problem. And so I found it very challenging because I had several bosses um, all pressing different buttons and asking me to do things, but I was there as the representative of the president um, and I had to relate and negotiate with my counterparts, the hosts, the Brazilians, uh, in trying to make this work. Because uh, at the end of the day, we all wanted to have a, a, a safe and um, uh, successful, fun games. That's what you want at the end of the day, but you need to be prepared. Um, and so in the background, all this stuff goes on and people are responsible for it. And it was a challenge uh, that, you know, sometimes you see these efforts and I know for instance, today, we're all sitting here, everything's synchronized and you're all sitting in the audience, everything is coming together perfectly. But behind this, I know a lot of people have worked on getting everything right. And so, so uh, it is challenging. Uh, to get that uh, done right, because again, you've got many bosses and respond with different priorities, um, and it's knowing that you have that. And how do you how do you respectfully manage this so you don't burst? Because if there's a lot of pressure uh, put on uh, leaders uh, to produce and to produce well, and sometimes there are circumstances you can't control. But it's a matter about of, of being poised uh, and knowing what is important uh, in, in, in getting that mission accomplished. But how you get it accomplished is just as important as accomplishing the mission. You don't want to be disrespectful in the process because you want to get to that final point. You have to know that you're dealing with people and you've got to uh, deal with uh, you know, uh, with respect uh, because at the end of the day that will resonate uh, as uh, you personally as as a leader and and qualities of a leader. So getting back to the to the example of, of the Olympics, uh, no one saw that. Everyone had a great time. Uh, we had very successful. Um, Olympics, uh, the U.S. team, uh, which was the largest at the time in, in the history, did a tremendous job uh, and got lots of medals and we saw all the fun. But behind that, uh, there, there are some leadership skills that, that require some, some fine tuning, careful navigating the process, but always with respect. Thank you, Ambassador Valde, for the response.
Another question moving forward is, what can our country do in order to maintain the position of responsibility and leadership when it comes to world affairs? Uh, good question. Um, I think it's important for us as, as the United States to be uh, represented in different multilateral and international organizations to have a seat at the table. Uh, and you know, there may be times where that seat at the table may require some uh, showing of power, uh, but at the end of the day, it's about those friendships and those allies and finding those areas of convergence uh, where we agree um, through dialogue, you know, because at the end of the day, we sit in these international uh, multilateral organizations because we want to uh, avoid conflict, avoid a crisis, address um, the growing uh, challenges in the, in the global uh, setting uh, that every day become more complex and we can't do it alone. Uh, we have to work with each other. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I worked at the Southern Command uh, as the civilian deputy commander uh, and that is in, based out in Miami. And one of the things that we did was work with our partners in the region on trying to control the illicit drug traffickers. Um, you know, they're trafficking in drugs, but they're also trafficking in people, trafficking in arms. So there's lots going on. Uh, and you need a lot of intelligence. But if we all only look at what's happening within our borders, uh, we can't tackle the issue. So we worked very closely to coordinate that with other countries so we could share information. Because if you're only focusing on what's happening domestically, you miss uh, tackling the, the issue, which may be coming at you from a different direction, right? So if you sit down in these international um, bodies and uh, share intelligence, share information about what you're seeing, you can become much more effective at tackling the issue. And that could be everything from global climate change to you know, uh, trying to tackle the pandemic, which is a clear example that crosses borders. So it's important to have a seat at this table and to develop the, the linkages with partners or with allies to be able to share information and to be able to jointly come up with solutions that will be responsive to issues that go beyond our borders. So um, it takes the leadership skills that you are learning uh, in the school. And those are all traits that will be very helpful. And in, if you end up in, uh, serving in uh, international bodies, such as the ones I've referenced. Thank you, Ambassador Alde. In addition to those of us in the room, we have other students across the state that's joining virtually today. Um, that's joining today virtually for today's speaker series. We will start with our Houston campuses. Windmill Lakes Orem High School, what is your question for Ambassador Ayalde? It's an honor to meet you. My name is Yvonne Alfonso. I'm a senior here at Windmill Lakes Orem High School. And my question for you today is, what influenced your decision to become an ambassador and what unexpected challenges did you face to achieve this goal? So that's an interesting uh, question for me because I am kind of untraditional, an uh, untraditional example of how to become an ambassador. Uh, I joined the Foreign Service, but it was not in my plans. I didn't say, okay, I'm joining because eventually I want to become an ambassador. It was just um, a trajectory that I think, like looking back on it, 
it was based on um, the, the particular uh, instance I mentioned to you, the passion about what you're doing and doing the right thing and, and working with teens and working effectively with teens. So here I was in Colombia as the director for USAID. We were in the midst of uh, what they call Plan Colombia, working together with the Colombians on trying to address some of the issues related to the internal conflict with the guerrillas. And so we were doing amazing things, uh, demobilizing the ex-combatants, child combatants, working with the displaced populations. We were um, um, providing health care and providing, um, jointly with the Colombians that is, uh, working on education programs, trying to reintegrate the former combatants into society, a lot of fascinating things. And I was very happy um, doing what I was doing. Uh, and someone very senior up came for a visit and tapped me on my shoulder and said, you know, we'd like you to be ambassador. And I kind of looked over and I said, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing. Um, but again, being an ambassador is a tremendous honor and privilege, so I couldn't say no. So it wasn't really planned. Um, and at that point, of course, I ended up being um, uh, delighted with the, with the offer and the, the possibility of serving as U.S. ambassador to Paraguay. I was nominated, was confirmed by the Senate. Um, and then I sworn in at, at a very interesting time in Paraguay and just enjoyed every, every minute of serving there. Um, and I finished that and I went back to Washington and was working a different job, I did Deputy Assistant Secretary at State. And then I was one year into the job and I get a, a call from the front office on behalf of the secretary. The secretary at the time was Secretary Clinton, and she said, we want you to go to Brazil. And I go, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do with my senior daughter who was, uh, or she was going into her senior year. We decided, uh, so that was a challenge, uh, but as a family, we decided it was the right thing to do. And we went and we took this amazing experience uh, of serving as U.S. Ambassador to Brazil. Um, so my trajectory was unique. I did join the Foreign Service like any other diplomat, but I joined in the development field and then moved into the State Department because I was invited to join in. Um, and then of course, uh, uh, my last assignment in, in Southern Command. So uh, it was not planned, but there were challenges on, along the way of, uh, uh, you know, moving from one from one culture to the other, things that you will probably be exposed to, uh, and that is when you know the military has a very different culture from the State Department has a very different culture from the development world. One is short term, one is long term, one's new. and so you speak a different language, you have a different thing, different traditions, and so it's part of learning. Uh, that's why I say one is always learning. Um, and just be tuned in to, to always be learning as you go along. Thanks for the question. Thank you for your question, Member Lakes. Our next question is from Katie West Park High School. Katie West Park, what's the question? Muy buenas tardes, Embajador Ayalde. Es un placer el poder hablar con usted. My name is Andrew Lorente, and I'm a senior currently enrolled at the KWHS campus. I know that throughout the span of your career, you have been able to help multiple people. So my question is, what has been the most memorable time in which you were able to have a positive impact in someone's life? So Andrew, I have to, I have, before I answer your question, I have to say one thing that's very interesting. So my second last name is Llorente. Um, and so we've got something in common. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'll answer, I won't answer in Spanish so that everyone can understand, but um, so you asked about 
memorable moments. And I have to say, you know, I can think of many. I just, just thinking about it, there, there's so many uh, memorable moments that come to, to my mind. Um, uh, and particularly in the kind of work we do, uh, or did because I'm now retired, but in USAID, a lot of it was about giving people the tools uh, to be able to prosper and to be successful citizens and have good livelihoods. But uh, let me give you a couple of examples just to, to il illustrate what it was that we do, uh, what we did and, and, and why it was so um, uh, memorable. So when, when I was in Bolivia, um, I can think of this situation where we were working with some small farmers and uh, we helped together with our Ministry of Agriculture provide them with some uh, technical know-how, best practices on how to uh, produce Vidalia onions. Um, and those Vidalia onions, interestingly enough, were the Vidalia onions used by McDonald's on the hamburgers. And it so happened that there's a certain time in the year where the United States doesn't produce enough Vidalia an, uh, onions for the, the demand of those hamburgers domestically here. So we were able to work with these farmers and it changed their lives because they then had an income and they produced these amazing onions that were then exported to the United States at the particular time in the year where domestically here in the United States we couldn't produce, but there was the demand because we never get tired of, 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 of hamburgers and, and the daily onions are just part of it. So I just remember those farmers um, and the, you know, how happy they were that their lives were changed because they, first of all, they got the tools, the tools to know how to produce quality onions. And we linked them up with the market um, to sell them. I mean, they couldn't have done it by themselves. So, so that's a particular memorable one. The other uh, is that um, I've done a lot of disaster response and humanitarian assistance in, in, the, in my career, just because of the nature of what I did. And um, because I specialized in Latin American studies, I ended up doing a lot in the region, which is prone to disasters, hurricanes, volcanoes, fires, earthquakes. And um, so when you are part of this, you don't forget the faces of the people. And I do remember very vividly my experience during Mitch in Nicaragua, where I, uh, what happened there, there were torrential rains for weeks and uh, suddenly there was this massive mountain that, that came down the was a mudslide and engulfed a number of communities. Um, and of course, many, unfortunately, many people died in the process. And um, so my job was to go out there and figure out what was needed together with the local authorities and as US government, try to provide some immediate humanitarian assistance uh, for those survivors. And of course, those are images that one never forgets. So throughout my career, um, I've just figured, I've, I've, I've experienced many, many of these vignettes and I could certainly go on and I, I don't wanna take too much time, but, but these are very memorable um, in, in my mind. And I felt that I made a difference. I could make a difference by just connecting uh, and being respectful of, of you know, their needs and being there at the right place at the right time, working with the local authorities, to try to get what we could offer uh, in technology and know-how and assistance to make people's lives better. Thank you, Katie Westbrook High School. Next up is College Station, Aggie Ellen. What is your question? Hi, my name is Gracie Flores and I'm a senior at Aggie Ellen High School. 
My question for you is, as an ambassador, how have you worked through cultural differences that were either unexpected or have made your work more challenging? Could you repeat that, please? As an ambassador, how have you faced as an ambassador, how have you worked through cultural differences that were either unexpected or have made your work more challenging? So uh, unexpected circumstances due, due to, to culture. Yes, as, as an ambassador world, we always have to um, learn how to work in the context of different cultures. I think uh, going back to my earlier point about listening, uh, learning uh, that always when you're doing cross-cultural uh, engagements, you have to dedicate some time into learning about each other, right? And um, I remember one time I was in Bolivia and I was asked to be on a stage like this and we had just finished some training sponsored by the U.S. Embassy and I was asked to give the diplomas and they shook the, very differently, you know, they, they they were like giving me a hug and then uh, shaking their hands. I was very flustered. I had not done my homework. Someone had not taught me that there was a special way of greeting. And, um, you know, if I had spent a little bit more time or if somebody that was with me had given me a little bit of heads up, I would have, um, uh, I would have known what to do. But I learned my lesson that, you know, when you're in, in, um, in different environments and different cultures, you have to uh, appreciate that there is different ways of doing things and you just, you know, uh, learn about them, uh, appreciate them. Uh, and th that's important as, as ambassadors to be respectful of different traditions, uh, different realities. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, we do things differently than, than in other countries, but just being aware that the way you do things may not be the only way to do it. There may be another way. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to the same, uh, to look at um, different challenges through different ways and, and, and get to the same uh, results uh, differently, but by being conscious that there are different ways of doing things. Thank you, Annie Lam. Next, let's go to our Dallas area. Lancaster DeSoto High School, what's your question? Hi, my name is Faith Castillo and I'm a senior here at the Lancaster DeSoto campus. Here at IL Texas, we learn three languages, Chinese, Spanish, and English. I understand that you speak Spanish, Portuguese, and have some knowledge in French. With that being said, how have being multilingual helped you in your career? Oh, language has been very instrumental for me. Um, I think I, uh, let me say, I applaud all of you for learning a language, not one language, but two language languages early, because as you get older, it becomes more complicated. So if you learn it early, uh, you've got a tool for life. Uh, doors will open, um, and in this world, which is getting much interconnected, there's nothing like having a language. And I felt that in my career, I would not have gotten to where I got uh, without my language skills. Uh, as you join the Foreign Service, you are required to have at least one language. Uh, you're tested, and that helps you. You, know, you get extra points, depending on the languages you speak and so forth. And then some countries require the language to go, but there's nothing like working in the, the native language and understanding without an interpreter. Uh, you're much, much more effective. Uh, you can understand quicker, you get things done. Uh, but I think it's a matter of respect as well. Let me give you an experience I had. So when I was assigned to Brazil, um, I was nominated at the time we had the best of relationships. Bilateral relationships were great. President Obama had invited the then President Dilma Rousseff to a state visit. And around the state visit, all these things were being moved and accomplished. And so everything that was this, this buzz about it. And then 
um, while the, the nomination process was proceeding, after I'd gotten confirmed, before I was sworn in, there was a big issue between our two countries, uh, something called Snowden disclosures that has to do with intelligence. And as a result of that, the president of Brazil felt that she had, she was very angry at what was happening, what had happened. And she personally felt, uh, felt uh, insulted. And she said, I'm canceling this visit. I'm not going to the United States. I'm not going to the White House. Imagine, you know, this is pretty, pretty tough. And there I was, bushy tailed, ready to go to Brazil. And I get there, and, you know, she had indicated that no political engagement. Uh, so everything was stopped. You know, all the plans of things that we're going to be doing. And people were very demoralized within the embassy. And I had to present my credentials. I had to present my credentials to her. There was a lot of concern as to what she would say to me um, and that it would be very awkward and uh, difficult because sometimes messages, and it's really not about me, but it's the relationship between our two countries. So there I was and I was asked, do you need an interpreter? And I said, no, I think I can do this. Uh, I speak well in Portuguese, I can do it. So everyone was very nervous. We had reporters looking at us and I walked up to the president and I said in fluent Portuguese and not only fluent Portuguese, but Portuguese with an accent of a particular part of the country. And she was blown away. She didn't know what to say to me. She was like, ah, oh, wait a minute, you're one of us. You're Brazilian. And I go, no, I'm not Brazilian. I'm a representative of President Obama in the country. I'm very honored to be here. I want to work with you. And we entered in the conversation, and she was in awe that I had the language skills. And so all the fear about how we would start a relationship uh, was put in the back, and you know, we started off right. So for me, um, that was, it was my language skills that helped me nap. I couldn't have had an interpreter go through that. It would have been very awkward. It could have been done. It was done by several other ambassadors that, uh, that didn't speak the language. But the fact that I could have that personal contact and that she realized, oh my gosh, she speaks our language. That took a lot oh, to make the investment and that helped tremendously. And I can't tell you how many of those experiences I had. You know, and when you talk about sensitive issues, you want to be able to sit in a room and be able to negotiate through these issues without having people interpret what you're saying. And as a native Spanish speaker sitting in a room, sometimes when the interpretation goes along, and I know the nuances, and the wrong word is chosen, it could derail the conversation. Um, you know, I feel like, oh dear, I have jumped in. I have jumped in because sometimes the, the uh, interpreters are called, you know, oh, like, you know, you speak a little Spanish, so maybe you can do this. Well, no, you know, interpretation is very, um, a specialized field. But the point is that there's nothing like speaking the language to communicate, to communicate clearly, to avoid issues, you can, uh, you know, it, it helps you in, in terms of saving time and making friendships. Uh, and the, at, the, at the end of the day, it's respectful. Uh, so um, that's why I like uh, IL Texas, the program and the initiative so much because there is a strong emphasis on language skills which I'm sure will just be so helpful for each of you in whatever field you choose to go into. Uh, and, uh, it, just, it just will change your lives. And besides, it opens a lot of windows for opportunities in areas that require the language skills. And so you'll be able to choose because you have those skills. So. Thank you, LDHS. Next up is Garland High School. Garland, what is your question? 
Hello, my name is Jasmine Crutchfield, and this year I'm a senior at the Garland High School campus. And my question for you is, este mes en IELTS, Texas, estamos celebrando el mes de la herencia hispana. ¿Qué estamos celebrando en todos los campus de IELTS, Texas? Why do you think it is important to recognize the generations of Hispanic Americans who have positively influenced our nation and society? Así es. Este mes estamos celebrando el mes de la hispanidad. It's a moment to showcase, uh, to highlight uh, all the contributions that have been made by various Hispanic generations uh, in so many fields, in the arts, in the sciences, uh, in government, uh, in politics, uh, in, and it enriches um, our society. And I think uh, diversity is one of our strengths. And so I, I think that uh, having this month to celebrate uh, is a very uh, appropriate. Um, Hispanics, according to the last census, and that was conducted in 2020, so in the midst of the pandemic, uh, indicated that um, the country has about, I think it's about 60% of its population are um, uh, Hispanics, um, and, and that is uh, growing. Uh, it certainly has grown from, uh, from the last census. Uh, and, you know, that means a lot of diversity. 60% of the Hispanics are traditionally of Mexican heritage, but that is changing faster and faster. I myself am Colombian American, and I'm watching how the Colombian Americans uh, um, are contributing more and more to the diversity of the Hispanics in the country, but not only Colombians, but uh, from all countries in, uh, in, in the region, um, uh, the heritage uh, is what makes the country richer in traditions. Uh, and I was just mesmerized by walking uh, through the schools. Uh, we, we, we had an earlier visit and um, saw all the murals and the colors and the, uh, the festive motifs that were put on display to celebrate this 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 month that gives us an, an opportunity to ce celebrate all those generations of contributions. And I have no doubt that the Hispanics in this room will continue to, uh, to contribute in very important ways in whatever uh, sector you do to, whether it's in the science and technology or arts, uh, government, uh, business, uh, you name it, uh, you will be very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Garland High School. Next up is Arlington Grand Prairie High School. What is your question? Good afternoon, Ambassador Ayale. My name is Daniel Alvarez, and I am the representative for IL Texas Arlington Grand Prairie High School. My question to you is, what advice would you give to someone who is trying to change the world, but thinks they're too young or do not come from the right background? There is no such thing as having the age or the right background to be a leader and to succeed. Uh, you can come from anywhere uh, and you could be at any age and be successful. Uh, and lead and succeed. So I would say, just go ahead and soar and, and move. You know, it's it's not. Uh, you know, that's why you're called eagles. You're going to soar, and uh, you know, you're here. You're younger than I am, so you're young leaders. But you know, there's nothing that that could be uh, um, uh, a deterrent in helping you uh, succeed. And certainly not your background, they're not your age, that will not stand in the way of, of having you be successful in advancing your dreams and, and, and um, getting things done and uh, being a big contribution to society. So uh, I don't see those as issues, they are not issues. 
Thank you, Arlington Grand Prairie, for your question. Next, we have a question in our very own studio audience. Ms. Heichel, your question. Hi, my name is Molly Heichel, and I'm a senior here at KSHS. We have one final question for you, ma'am. In your opinion, what's the most important trait a leader can have, and how is that trait important in the field of foreign affairs? So I think um, integrity is what I would highlight as an important trait because integrity uh, encompasses many different things. It talks about being ethical, uh, being honest, and being respectful. And those are values that I think are important as a representative of the US government. And so as a leader, I thought that those were, if, because the negative of that is really bad if you're not honest, if you're not ethical, if you're not respectful. So to me, the, that quality is just key in advancing our, you know, whatever we want to accomplish, uh, you do it with respect. You do it with with integrity and honesty, and those are values that everyone's going to be able to tell. Oh my God, that person's not honest, right? And so you want to be able to be the one that that carries those those uh, those values, um, and you can be so much more effective. Uh, and certainly, as in the foreign affairs, and as a diplomat, you know we represent certainly as an ambassador, 24 seven, I'm a, a US ambassador. And so there was not a minute of the day that I could say, oh, you know, I'm just gonna be this or that, the other. People will be watching. Um, and, and so uh, it was, that was probably one of the challenges, you know, as ambassador, but um, that you never could, could forget that you are there to represent the US government. So there was no private time, but that means that you, you have to carry the, the values that represent us well. And to me, it's integrity, uh, which encompasses honesty, uh, trustworthiness, and respect. Thank you, KSHS, and thank you so much for everything you shared with us, Ambassador Ayalda. Uh, sorry. Um, sadly, we're running out of time, but thanks again for just coming here and for sharing all of your lessons in leadership to us. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Feel free to stop by any Isle Texas campus whenever you're in Texas. Thank you for that invitation. Thank you every, for, to everyone. We also want to give a big shout out and thank you to the students and to the production team who ran this event behind the scenes. This event is student led and executed. Great job team. To all our eagles all around the state. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, you've learned so much valuable lessons in this leadership series. Don't forget, the recording of this event will be posted at ILTexas.org. Be on the lookout for any new announcements for any leadership speaker series coming very soon. Don't forget, let's soar, eagles.